Right, there we are. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, sorry for being slightly late. Um, so last week we've seen variables, and variables is like the yin and the yang of programming. So basically you really need variables which are your data that you operate with in your programs. It's the information that you use. Today we'll see the other part, mainly um, assignments and expressions and, um, and statements. And that is basically what you do with that data. And also together, you know, after today, we will see everything you'll need to know about programming. Everything else is nice to have and makes programming nicer, but in essence, you could already create any program after today in C++. So what we've seen is that when you create a variable, what is really happening is in memory, some memory space is being reserved, and the meaning is given to that piece of memory. It's a certain size, and uh, the computer is interpreting this in a certain way. And this is our types, you know, that the, it could be a symbol, it could be a number, and if it's a number, it could be a whole number, or it could be a floating point number. And if it's a floating point number, it could be a float or a double. That's what we've seen. Or it could be also a Boolean. That's kind of the, the basic types that we've seen. And with that, we can kind of create almost every type of information. Right, so this is basically what we have seen already. And um, whenever we uh, need a variable, we need to declare it first. Typically, we do this straight at the start. So we know that our main function, we don't know yet officially what functions are, but our main function is basically where our program starts. And from there on, we first say what type of information we have, you know, what our ingredients are, and then we tell the compiler what type of statements are needed to deal with that data. And that's what's coming later on today. So if we create, for instance, a symbol, which we call my symbol, we can give it any name we want. We've seen that there's a couple of exceptions, but uh, we can give it very long names, uh, our own typical names that we would like. And we can also immediately initialize it or not into a value. And then later on, and that's also something we've seen, but we only officially will know today what this really means, is we can assign a value to these uh, variables. And typically, these uh, values that we have, like true over here, or the 0, .0 0.0, or this 1.85f, are constants. And in a way, those are also variables, except that they are not variable, they're constant. They can't be changed anymore. Once you put them in your program, they're an entity, they're also somewhere in memory, but they can't be changed anymore. Right? So the, also that is a piece of information that is somewhere in memory, and also this piece of information has a certain type. Right? So we can see that this 1.85f is a floating point, and more specifically, a float. So if uh, we remember from last week, then we know that this is um, being taking up uh, memory, four bytes in total, this has a certain interpretation, uh, so that we can store quite large numbers and floating point numbers in this piece of memory. But we can't change it anymore. It has the value 1.85, and that's it. The same for this um, quotation mark, ampersand quotation mark. We know that this is a constant character, and a character is nothing else but a number from 0 to 255, which is an index in this ASCII table that we've seen. Right? So that is, that is what we... Um, we, we finished that last uh, week, and during the exercise session I showed these slides as well, so I won't uh, tell you too much what, uh, um, what this entails, but when we write a program, our compiler basically starts reading it, and then in our main function, starting from this line over here, it will first, or we typically first have our variables, and then we have our um, statements. And these statements are going from top to bottom, from left to right, they're usually, no, they're always um, separated by these semicolons in C++, and uh, each of those statements is telling what to do, is telling the compiler what to do. So you take uh, the variable my symbol and you give it the value a, as the symbol a. Or in this case, you, and this is something that we'll see much later, uh, we take the standard uh, console out, that means our terminal, and to that we print my symbol first, and then we print an end line character. So it goes to the next line. And then we give a new value to our my symbol, namely the Q. And then we do exactly the same thing again, so that in the end we print first an A, then a Q. And then 
we have this return zero, as we said. Once we, have, we are there at the end of our function, we return back to the operating system and give this value to our operating system. Right? That's basically what happens when you create a program. And all we've seen so far is that uh, we have variables and constants, and they're basically the same thing. They're just a uh, space in memory with a particular interpretation and a name. Right. What we've also seen is the scope, and this is coming back today. So whenever we have curly braces, you can think of it like this, whenever you have curly braces and you introduce a new variable in those curly braces, like this integer c over here, then as soon as you leave those curly braces, then that integer is not there anymore. It's deleted from memory. That means if you try to access this value of our variable c, our compiler will complain. This is something that is called a block and that we'll see today again. Um, and this will become a little bit more complicated once we start seeing multiple ways of creating blocks. You can create a block wherever you want, you know, in your, in your functions, typically. Um, so it's, you can create these curly braces. And with our indentation rules, we see that we need to indent them so that we see that this is a separate block that does something. And the only thing that you remember, uh, need to remember for the variables is that if you created a variable in a block, it will not be there after you leave the block. And again, there, uh, the compiler goes from top to bottom. That means after he's gone through this line, C does not exist anymore because it was introduced here and deleted right over here. Okay? Those are very essential pieces that you need to understand and just uh, be able to deal with. Right. Conversions we've seen as something that is typically, um, or could be really complicated if you would have to learn this by heart. Many other introduction to programming uh, courses do this. They require students to learn that you can convert, for instance, a double to a float with certain uh, uh, side effects, but a float to a double is easy, and you can do this implicit. But in this case, I would ask you to never do things implicit. If you have a constant, or if you have a variable or multiple of those, they will always have a type. And if you then use those with operators or with functions later, then they would need to have exactly the type that you would expect them to have. That means if you have an assignment and your assignment over here is C, which is a character, then on the right side, we need a character. If it's a float in this case, like you can see from the, from the um, content over here, then we always explicitly convert this to a character. And this is usually possible. If it's not, then the compiler will warn you and will say in a very nice error, um, typically, that you cannot do this in C++. Right? But that is much better than doing this implicitly, leaving this away, and then finding out whether C++ allows this or not. Then you would have to learn this priority table by heart, or then you would have to uh, do a lot more thinking. Um, and here we don't need that. If you just say, as a, as a convention in programming, we always explicitly convert, then I think it's a lot easier. And typically, you can also convey things or avoid things by uh, programming things in such a way that you typically don't need to convert from one type to another as well. Okay? But that's something that we will see uh, many times again as well. And then we left with this piece of homework saying, you know, we have here a program where we have three types or, or three characters that we reserve in our memory. We know that a character is one byte and that it basically is uh, a number. Um, and we initialize them immediately as those characters, question mark, ampersand, and hash. And then we output them to the terminal, just like in the previous example. Now, the homework was, how can you write this more memory efficiently? Did anyone think about this? Okay, I see people nodding, but uh, do you know more or less what the answer is? We can actually reserve, I mean, what, what, what we reserve in terms of memory is three characters, so three bytes in this case. Can we reduce this? Can we make this program a little bit more memory efficient? Yes, how? Don't be afraid. Just blurt it out, even if it's wrong, it doesn't matter. Sorry? We have an array here. An array, yes, but that we don't know yet. Officially, we don't know about arrays. And even that, an array would in this case not help that much. Yes? Not using variables. Not using variables, exactly. That is, <laughs> that is actually the answer I was going to give. Um, but So you jumped already ahead to the perfect answer. We could just 
scratch all those variables and we could uh, put here the, the constants, question mark, ampersand, and hash. Because those are the constants that are also in memory, so that we have three bytes as variables in memory, but we also have here three bytes for the constants in memory. We could just half immediately our memory requirements for this program. Excellent, thank you. I was hoping that somebody would say we can also deal with just one character. We call it my character. We first assign it a question mark, then we output that character, then we uh, assign it a new value, and so on. This would be one byte more than your solution, right? But this is how you need to think about programming. You reserve memory space and the efficiency of your program can be greatly increased uh, with small th tricks like that. So if you know that constants and variables take up memory space and that you can reuse variables or that you can just use a constant, then that is of course something that will create much more efficient programs. The question on the other side, however, is, is it then more readable afterwards? And that is a completely different matter, right? It's kind of a trade-off sometimes. So you can make programs really efficient, but very hard to read afterwards for anybody else or even yourself after a few weeks. Good, but thank you, that, that, that was an excellent answer. Or those were two excellent answers actually that will spur uh, a lot of uh, more discussion. So today we're going to see what we can do with the data that we create in our program, the variables and also the constants, which I kind of count as variables that can't be changed anymore. And that is done inside the statements. And assignments are also statements. We've seen assignments already. So once you have a variable and you put the equal sign there, then that's an assignment. And we kind of dealt with it already without seeing what it was. Today we're going to see what it is. Um, and again, we're going to do this through many, many examples. So statements is everything that is uh, separated with those semicolons. So even creating a variable is a statement. It's telling the compiler, now create for me three integers in memory, and we call them x, y, and note, and they're integers. Or create me a boolean in memory, and we call the b. That is basically what is happening. And for each statement, um, the compiler will execute or will do this statement for us. So the first two is reserving memory space and calling, m making sure that whenever we call those names, we access that memory space. We can call up the value of those variables, or we can change the value of those variables. And that's exactly what we do in the next line. So in this case, the value of x is basically renewed in this case because of this assignment operator over here. And it means everything on the right side of this equal sign, which is in this case the constant 2. Which type is a constant 2? Integer. integer, exactly. x is also an integer, so everything is fine. So we basically assign the value 2 for an integer to our integer x, our variable x. So from now on, our x, whenever we call the, 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 the variable x, we get back 2, because that is the value of our, uh, of our x. This is something we've seen explicitly, uh, implicitly already uh, last week, because assignment is basically giving values to variables. The same for mult. Mult is also an integer. One is also an integer. You assign the value 1 to our variable mult. And now, in this case, it becomes a little bit more complicated because today we will see also that we have operators. We've already seen them, actually, the operators. We know that star already by now is multiplication, so we multiply x by 7. Again, x is an integer, 7 is an integer, so we do an integer multiplication here. Now, the question is what happens when we divide by 2? This division is also an operator that operates on two integers. So 2 is an integer x times 7 will result in 2 times 7, so 14. 14 divided by 2 is 7, exactly. Now imagine we had here something bigger, like x is 3. Then we would have 3 times 7 is 21, and that divided by 2. What would be the outcome of that? Exactly, 10. But the error would also be going in the right direction because this is indeed integers, right? How can, uh, how can you uh, divide an integer by another in integer? Well, in C++ you can do this, but you lose everything after the, the dot, right? You, do you lose the floating point position. And this is perfectly fine. This is called integer division. 
So this operator is kind of looking at things on the left and things on the right, taking those two, and those are of a particular type. And depending on the type, the operator will do a particular thing. Also, that is something that we'll much later also think uh, again about. So this way we can assign something to a variable again and again and again. These are, these are assignments. And we'll see that these operators allow us to create shortcuts, to, to do things in a short uh, amount of space. Um, and that these things can be a little bit convoluted. Like over here, for instance. Here we have a, a test if um, this is not equal to this. And this is basically returning a Boolean. And this Boolean is then put into B. This is not very nice. As we will see, we typically try not to do this because this is not a very good style. But it is an assignment that is possible. And why? Well, that is something we'll see later. For now, just remember that an assignment is you take things on the right side of the equal sign. And this is usually returning a value if everything goes right. Or the compiler gives an error, as you said. And then if a value is returned, then you put that value into the variable that is on the left side. And it needs to be a variable. Otherwise, you will get an error. It makes kind of sense, but uh, that's the way it works. So operators we've seen already implicitly as well. We used, you know, with uh, a variable plus two, for instance, or we divided something already. Um, there are loads of operators. There are many more than these, but these are the only ones you will need in this course. So also again, we look at the sub subset, and with the subset you can do almost everything already. So we have certain types of operators. You don't need to learn this by heart, but some operators can be used in various ways. For instance, if you have 2 minus 1, then the minus is using two numbers, one on the left and one on the right side of the minus, right? But you can also say, for instance, x equals minus 7, then this minus is using only one uh, constant. So basically the constant 7 and then changes this into minus 7. Right? That is what is happening in the background. However, I try not to think about this, and I, you should not either. This is typically making a lot of sense if you just use those operators as, for instance, here on the first uh, row, the arithmetic operators. So plus is basically addition, minus is uh, um, subtraction, uh, but it can also be used for what, just one number, like plus 7 or minus 7. Um, you can use multiplication, you can use division, you can use modulo, this is basically the remainder after division. Um, you can increment and you can decrement numbers. And that's something you just have to learn to use and then you will know. It's basically like on a calculator, you will have very similar operators and you just learn how to, how to operate those operators. The same for relational. For relational, we will basically see if something is equal, then that this means this operator, which are two equal signs, which is different from, different from the one equal sign, which is an assignment, as we've seen. Right? If you have two equal signs, then this operator will take what is on the left and check whether this is exactly the same value as what is on the right. Right? So the, the values are taken from left and right, and we test whether those are the same. In that case, we have equal, equal sign. Or, as we've seen in the previous slides, if you have exclamation mark equal sign, this looks, if you squeeze your eyes a little bit, like the equal sign with a stripe through it. Right? That was the hope of the people that started this operator. So exclamation mark equal sign means not equal. So in that case, it will test whether what is on the left side is not equal to what is on the right side. And those two operators will basically give us a Boolean, a true or a false value. True if those two things are equal, or true in this case if those two things are not equal for the not equal uh, sign operator. So those are relation operators. We will see also logical operators, the and, the or, and the not. That's something we will see much later, or in a few slides. And then we have the assignment operator that we've seen already, plus shortcuts that uh, we can have there as well. So let's go first for the arithmetic operators. And also there, try it out. Try everything that is on the slides out by yourself. Uh, in, on the server, you can create any directory, which you can call whatever name you would want. You can go in there and then just program by yourself and see what happens. Try to break the system also there. Try to see what happens if something 
that is not on the slides happens, uh, or uh, uh, what happens when you try to you know, think out of the box a little bit, for instance. So do try out things. And here's already a couple of things that you could try out. I already explained here why and what is happening over here, but it kind of gives you a preview of what operators can do. So again, the first five lines here are assignments. That means you take what is on the right, this will lead to a value, and this value is copied into our variable that hopefully is created as well. In this case, we create loads of variables in one line, and we've seen that is possible. We could do this also line by line, but then I would quickly run out of space here. And we can also assign those variables particular values already. That's called initialization. Because typically, if we just, like with over here, initialize some, uh, create something as a variable, we cannot be certain that this is initialized to a certain value already. Typically, um, compilers create a, or create a variable and then immediately assign it to zero, but this is not always the case. So we can't be always certain. But if we immediately then assign the, uh, with a particular value, namely the value x plus y, then we know that we use this operator plus between two integers. That means it returns an integer. And uh, 5 plus 9 is indeed 14. That means the value of 14 is given to our integer width. Right? And this way we have loads of integer operations here. Now obviously we can do exactly the same for floats or doubles. Right? But then the operators would operate on different types of, uh, um, of variables. Now the only thing that not everybody always knows about or not always everybody is able to deal with is uh, this modulo operator. This modulo operator, however, is nothing more than the remainder after division. And that is typically not that hard um, uh, to think about, right? So basically, if you divide x by y, then you have a certain number, typically. And if those are two integers, then it's a whole number. But typically, there's also a remainder. And this remainder is what this operator gives you back. It does not give you back x divided by y. It gives you back what remains after you divide x by y. Right? That is, that is what is, what is uh, given here. And with Modulo, you can do certain things. Um, uh, for instance, test whether something can be divided by something else. Um, and that's something that we'll see in a second as well. Uh, but you also need to remember that the modal operator is then only available for integers and it's not available for floats or doubles because if you divide a floating point by another floating point, you will not have a remainder. You will receive a floating point, but there's no remainder in the division, right? So, th so that does not make sense. That means the compiler will give you an error if you try to use the modal operator between two floating points. Again, the importance of this type is, is really, really important in C++. Right, so here we have an example. Um, so here in this case, again, this is something I put explicitly on the slide now uh, because it's so important. If you have two integers, x and y, x is 3 and y is 7, um, I'm not sure if I made a mistake there. We'll see in a second. So if you assign z uh, to x divided by y, Okay, I needed to uh, switch those. So seven divided by three I wanted to have here, and it will definitely not be uh, two in this case. Um, but in this case, it will be integer division. That's actually, uh, okay. I'll, I'll change this immediately now, otherwise I'll forget about it, right? So s the idea is here, if you have seven and you divide this by three, then typically you would think it is uh, two point something, but since the division operator here is on two integers, you get a whole number back, namely two, right? Even though we didn't have six divided by three, that would be really two. We have seven divided by three, but it's integer division. Therefore, it's two point something something, but this point something something is not returned because we have integer division. Okay. Let's go for an example. Um, so we have here uh, a very simplistic example that please try this at home as well. Um, so we have here a small program where the only demand is that we initialize two integers. We need, to we need to give them particular names. Those names are valid in C++. You can't start with a number, but 
We start here with characters and then have a number. Um, and we need to test whether number one is a multiple of number two. And now knowing the model operator, or we need to practice a little bit with that model operator, we know probably what to do now, right? So let's try this out. So I already have prepared this. Let me see where. Not here, but here. Oh dear, what is happening here? Uh, I need to log in again. There we go. So I test, uh, basically I already have a program. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Right, so we have exactly what we had on the slides here. So you can quickly type this out yourself, of course. Um, and as usual, we have uh, the main function. We create a Boolean variable and immediately set it to false. And now we need to give to that Boolean value a check whether number one is a multiple of number two. How do you know this or how can you check this? Well, I hope you uh, know that if you see whether something is a multiple, if you then divide number one by number two, then you will get uh, a whole number, right? And nothing that remains. That means if we use the modulo operator now and we test whether what comes out of this is zero, so if the remainder after dividing number one by number two is zero, then we know that number one is a multiple of number two. And this is a trick that in programming happens again and again, and you will see that. And that is something that we can use with the operators that we've seen just now. So we have our model operator, and this returns zero if number one is a multiple of number two, and it re returns one or two or three if there is a remainder after that division. So if we then test whether this thing on the left is zero, that means if we test with the equal operator, if that over here is a zero and this is over here zero, then we have a test that will output a Boolean, right? So out of that will come either true or false. True if the modulo of number one, modulo number two is zero, and one if it's not zero, okay? So just using those operators, we have basically already our result. So we have result, which is a Boolean. So again, the assignment operator needs on the right side to have a value. This value is a Boolean, and it puts this Boolean into result, which is also a Boolean. And this result is then um, given back to the operating system. So I think this should be working. Let's see if it is working. So I'm going now on the left side. Um, as, as I said, whenever we want to compile our program, we just type G++ and the name of our program. I called it multi.cpp. We can also output then, for instance, our program name so it doesn't go to the default a.out. Oops, I have an error. Oh, and you didn't tell me already. <laughs> what did I not uh, do yet? Exactly. It's too early in the morning, I was sleeping. Um, so basically, we need to initialize, uh, create first of all two, two variables, because otherwise we would never be able to use them, right? And we also need to initialize them or give them an initial value. So we can just give them a, a, a big number, for instance. There we go. That is what number one is, and that is what number two is, for instance. And now the question is, is number one a multiple of number two? We will see. So let's try that again. We'll try again to compile. Oh, and again I have a problem. I forgot the semicolon. As I said, I need a coffee. Um, so we'll try that yet again. Let's hope that I indeed don't have any mistakes anymore now. Uh, oh, okay, I didn't save it. Sorry, that's why. So I r r save my, uh, my file. And now I finally have my executable. Now these are very typical things that probably you already bounced into as well in the past couple of week, uh, days, right? So not putting a semicolon will give you a particular error. Um, not initializing a variable or not creating the variable first will give you an error. Not saving your file will create very strange errors as well. So make sure you do all of that 
this has been a very good uh, explanation actually of the things that you always need to, to pay attention to. Right, so we created our program multi. So if we now look in our directory, we indeed have this executable multi that we can now execute. And as we've seen, we do this by dot slash, meaning in the current directory, we can then uh, execute multi. And we've executed it now. Now what we've not seen yet, I think, is how we get this value. So our um, program now gave this value to the operating system but we never printed this in the terminal, right? We didn't use std c out to output this into the console. We just gave it to the operating system. Now, let me see if I remember this actually. You don't need to know this by heart. This is just out of interest. But um, this is, I think, the way we get then the result back, which is zero, mean, meaning false, right? Because our Boolean was explicitly converted into an integer. So false is uh, converted into a zero true is converted into a one. So the number 26,437 is not a multiple of 23, right? If we do something like this, then we should get a one, right? We should get, in the end, a true in this case. And then that, in that case, our um, operating system should then, after doing this, get back a one. So let's do that again. We have to recompile. And then we have to then redo our um, execution, we execute our program again, and then we look again what our operating system got back from the last command. That is what this echo um, dollar sign question mark means. And we got a one back. That means number one in this case is a multiple of number two, right? So this way we created a very small program where we didn't even need C out or put something into the terminal um, and we've seen now also how to how this is happening. All right, so try this at home and try to break things. Try different operators. Try to create your own um, uh, data or try to create your own variables with particular data types. There are different ways also of solving this, especially with the statements that we're going to see in just a few seconds. All right. Getting back to the slide. So this is. I would say difficulty level one pepper, right? So it's not that difficult yet. We will, at the end of the course here, or the end of the today's slides, see loads of exercises that I would entice you to do by yourself. Some of them are a lot harder. If you've already had programming in C or even C++, try it out, because they're not that easy usually, although they kind of build up on very basic concepts, because we were in week two, you know, of 14 weeks of classes, um, so how hard can it be? Well, it turns out it can actually quite, be quite hard sometimes. So this is a way to kind of visualize or see what is happening with relational operators. We just used one, this equal, right? You basically test whether something on the left is equal to something on the right. In this case, F1, in this case, is a double with a particular init initialized value already. And we've seen already from this constant that this is a double. If it was a float, it would have the small f at the end, right? And if you, if you basically, it's not an assignment, it's checking whether the left value is the same as the right value. It's not checking whether the variable is the same, it's checking whether the value of what is on the left is the same as the value on the right. That means if you would have F1 here and F2 here, it would ch take those values, it would take the 15.2 and it would take the 31.6, those are not equal, therefore it would return false, right? And it returns a Boolean. Also again, these uh, Boolean operators return Booleans. So this is not equal, so B1 is not equal to B2. Well, that's obviously false, and so on. And you can do this for other operators as well. So this is the is smaller than. It does just tests whether the value on the left side is smaller than what is on the right side, or is smaller than or equal, and that way you also have is bigger than or is bigger than or equal. The trick there or the thing that sometimes um, confuses people is where this equal sign is. It's always at the end, right? So it's, it's first, is it, equal, is it smaller or bigger than? And then you could also attach then the equal sign then or equal, right? That's, that's the way it is used. But it's basically testing whether the value of what is on the left is then smaller or equal than the value what is on the right for this particular line. 
And these things can be combined. And that's where it gets really interesting. So these first five lines, I think, are fairly easy to just try by yourself. You get a particular output then on the, uh, in the console, and you will say, yeah, that makes sense. You know, th those two are equal, or those two are not equal, or that one is indeed smaller than that one. But then if you start adding these, relation, uh, these logical operators, it gets slightly harder. And this logical operator and means what is on the left of this needs to be true, and what is on the right of this needs to be true. Right? So that means that must be true, and that must be true, and only then it will output true. And in all other cases, it will output false. Those of you who have already seen Boolean logic or logic in general will probably know this already. Um, but also there, this is a very basic programming concept, so you need to learn how to use this AND operator. The OR operator is a lot softer. The OR operator means I check if any of those two is true. So if this on the left side is true, or if that on the right side is true, and they can also be both true, doesn't matter. But if one of those two is true, then it will already output true. If both of them are false, only then. If both of them are false, it will output false. Okay? Try this out by yourself. By trying this out, you will learn how to do this. So here's another example of, the, of how to use OR. And this is our special, uh, we've noted this down in the, uh, two slides ago as a tertiary operator because it needs three things. It be, it is this question mark and this colon over here. And it needs three expressions, we call that. So the first thing is here something that returns a Boolean. And if this tr Boolean over here is true, before the question mark, then it will do this over here. And this is basically something, a value that it returns. And this value could be anything. It could be an integer, it could be a floating point, it could be a character, like here, it could be a Boolean. And if this is over here not true, then it will return this over here. And I put um, braces around this to kind of make sure that you see what is happening there. So the thing before the question mark is tested, if this is true, then this is returned. And if this is false, then this is returned. Right? It's a nice shortcut operator, I think, that also in C++ is used a lot. It's very nice and small, therefore it is used a lot. Because there is alternatives. As we will see in a few slides, there are expressions or clause, clauses that uh, are a bit longer. Exactly. The if else, as you've seen, is, or as you probably have seen that already, um, is, is an alternative with more capabilities and it's sometimes more readable. However, if you're used to this operator, it definitely pays off, okay? And those are the only operators so far that I, I think are really important. That's the only operators that we will see in this course. Here's a couple more um, uh, examples. So also again, try these assignment operators yourself. The only thing you need to know from this is that if the normal assignment operator will do almost everything for you already. The rest is kind of shortcuts. So if you see this minus before the equal sign, it is basically exactly the same as saying y equals y minus x, right? So shorter is y minus, uh, minus equals x. You just have to remember that this is exactly the same as saying y equals y minus x. And the same for the plus operator, the same for the division, and the same for modulo. So this is kind of just a shortcut. You could just drop those if you're programming yourself, and you say, I want to ni have nice code to, that is visual, then you never use those assignment operators. You just use this operator, the, the assignment operator that we know, which is the equal sign, right? So that is all, um, uh, all possible as well. Right. Now, once you have all those operators, we can combine them, as we've seen. The problem is then we need to know which operator is then executed first before another operator. And again, what we could do there is we could learn this table by heart. So there is this priority. So some operators have priority over other operators. So sometimes uh, uh, or is uh, having a priority over and, and is a priority over plus or minus, for instance and so on. Um, 
But to be honest, also there, if we use braces, it's very explicit what we want to have executed first. So on the in the previous slides, over here, for instance, we have a brace, we have braces over here with this uh, is not equal operator. That means we calculate this first, then we have these braces over here. That means we calculate this first, and only then we have these braces over here, and then we calculate the OR operator first. So we don't need to know that this uh, is bigger than or is not equal than operators have priority over the OR operator. By our braces, we kind of tell our compiler, compute this first, compute this first, and only then we compute this OR operator first. So use the braces, and then you're, you don't have anything to learn by heart in a table. Which is this table? You can learn it by heart. But I would say in this course, we stick to using braces because then everybody clearly sees what your intentions are. What operator you first want to have uh, executed to get a value, and then which one is next, okay? And it's usually hard because uh, unlike our statements in our program, which are calculated from top to bottom, left to right, the operators are not like that. Right? So some operators have priority, that means those are executed first and it might lead to problems in your program. But we use braces and therefore it's very clear which operators are being executed first. Okay. So here are some examples of how this uh, is sometimes very readable, but I mean, I think for this operator you know what is happening, right? So is the times operator first or is the plus operator first? Yes, so basically there you kind of get to know this, but if you want to really um, uh, have a very explicit way of doing this, you can use braces. So you say, I first want my multiplication to happen, and only then I add d, or the value of d to that. And then I calculate uh, for this operator what the value is. Right? So here's a couple of examples of what you could do there. The only thing that is really tricky here with in terms of uh, precedence are these operators, this plus plus and minus minus. Now this plus plus and minus minus I've seen, or oh, not yet explicitly, um, but it is increment and uh, decrement. So basically when you have the plus plus A over here, I've seen this in a previous slide, I think it's four or five slides ago, but it means you take the value of A, increment it by one, and then you give this value to A as well. So it's an operator that increments something, but also assigns this value to our variable. And this means that our value of A is changing. So it's different from A plus one, right? So A plus plus means it's A plus one, but also this is assigned to A. So this is the same as saying A equals A plus one. Now, this is one tricky bit about this increment, or you have also the minus minus, which is decrement, like minus one. It happens that you could put this plus plus before the variable, or you could put this after the variable. And this has a very particular meaning. It means if you put this before the variable, and then you can just see what is happening here. Our variable a is getting the value of 10, Hopefully we initialize this as an integer, for instance, uh, because this is a constant integer. In this case, 10 is incremented by one, so we have an 11, and this value is given to A. Now, if you do this as a prefix, so if the plus plus is before A, then this value is immediately given to A, and only then we use our equal sign operator, which is also an operator, right? So we take this value that is coming out of this, which is 11, and this is being assigned to B. So in this case, B is assigned to 11. That's, I think, what would be logical to most of you if you would read this. However, and this is kind of pervasive in C++, in the name already, because you have C++, meaning you increment the value of C, because there was already this programming language C, and you increment on top of that. Sir. So in this case, you have also A++. A has, again, the value of 10. You increment this value and assign this to the value of A. However, this assignment of the value of, uh, of A and this output of uh, what this increment leads to 
is then usually coming after all the other oper operators. And this operator, therefore, is assigned first. That means this assignment operator here, you know, we give B a new value, is then taking the value of A, not the value of A++. plus plus, right? And that's the tricky bit. So in this case, B over here, after this line, becomes the value 10, not 11. <laughs> this is a tricky bit that I try to now and then practice for during the assignments and the exercises. This is something that you would have to know because it's so pervasive in C++. It's kind of like um, uh, a trick in a way, but it's also something that you really need to be aware of. Otherwise, you might be completely dumbfounded later on if this, for instance, happens in a loop uh, variable or in something also that is very basic, but you will have to, have to know why this is having this particular behavior. So do practice on this, the prefix and the postfix. Uh, decrement or, op uh, or increment operators. Right, now back to blocks. We've seen already if you have these curly braces and you can put them yourself anywhere in your program or typically in your main function, that's what we know so far, then we have a block defined. And that's what, what we call a block. It's kind of a, a scope, you can call it as well. But it's a, usually a series of statements. And again, statements are those things that are separated by a semicolon, right? So we assign 10 to our variable length, we assign 15 to our variable width, and then we assign the outcome of length times width to our variable surface. Those are three statements. And this last statement is a bit longer because first we have to see what this operator tells us, and then we have to give that value to our variable surface. All of those are integers. But it's easy to see what is happening after what. So it's a sequence. Sometimes those sequences belong together and you can use those as a block in your code. And sometimes that is very nice because you can say we open the curly braces, then we go to the next line and we indent that by two spaces as we're going to do this throughout the course. And then we have those three lines on typically on three different, uh, uh, three different uh, um, statements on three different lines. And then we have again the curly braces that we close this with. So you can see, or everyone that can look at your program sees, this is a block that belongs together. Uh, like we have over here, this block belongs together. Typically, you would also add here a comment saying what you're doing in this particular block. For instance, you calculate the surface. And then you say these are the, the three statements where we calculate the surface, for instance. Now what is, uh, and again a repetition there, what is very important to know if you do this, that if you create a variable, a new variable over here, then this variable is not accessible anymore afterwards. So this would lead to an error. So we create our variables length and width. Those are both integers. Those get to particular values from in integer constants at the beginning of our program. And then we create a block ourselves because we think, you know, this is something that should be separated. In this case, it doesn't make much sense because it's just one statement, but anyway. And in this statement, we, have, we create a new variable surf, for surface, for instance, and we assign it the value of length times width, right? So that is perfectly possible. Since, however, we created a block for this, after leaving this block, this integer surf is completely out of memory again. It's wiped out because we leave this block. Length and width are still there, but surface is not there anymore. And if we then try to do something with surf, our compiler will say, I don't know this variable. It's not in memory. What you had a question. You want access and the block in the, uh, in the open of the program. Uh, does that run like something like a tool ball or something? Yes. So basically what you need to do then is put this in surf and reserve this variable already before the block. And then, of course, you can access it within the block, right? So then length, just like length and width, you can then access surf as well. So doing it like uh, on the left here is perfectly fine, but doing it on the right creates an error. And that's something you just have to be aware of. And this will become more relevant next week when we look at functions, because functions are kind of um, an extrapolation of this block with a lot of extras, by the way. But it, exactly the same thing happens there. You automatically have certain variables 
Um, but those variables you will lose after you end the block. But this does not mean that blocks are completely use useless, right? They are sometimes very useful. And especially if you now, I mean, from now we just know our main function. That means everything we do in our program is in our main function, and it's a sequence of statements. You could create now already many things, and this could be many, many lines. And by partitioning things in blocks, typically things become nicer to read. So that is one reason why a block is sometimes very useful. Just remember that if you create a new variable in that block, you lose it after you leave that block. That's all. Then it's still there. So basically, it, everything that is happening after leaving the block, so the question was, what if you initialize it in the block, like we do here? So we initialize surface here and give it a particular value. Now surface will still have its value afterwards because it's still in the memory. And the only thing that is done, but it's a very important question. So the only thing that is done is that variables are deleted. Uh, and that's another thing. In many compilers, you, the, the variable is deleted, but the value that the variable had in memory is sometimes still there, right? So in this case, we calculated 10 times 15. So surface is getting, uh, there's an integer in our memory call and that has the value 150 after this line. So when we stop here, we, don't, uh, we, we still have surface, but when we, for instance, go out of our main function, also there we leave a particular block surface as a variable is deleted after leaving our main function. But what can happen is that in that particular memory space, the value 150 is still there, but only with a few compilers, a very, very basic compilers, but it's possible, right? So the only thing that we have to think about is that we can't access that data anymore through our variables. Okay, but it's, I mean, that's indeed a very insightful question, especially for this slide. All right, let's start now with um, the three things, or the four things, actually, that will create now all the tools for you to create any program. It will be lengthy, and it will be a little bit uh, convoluted in ways, but from now on, after these four things, you will be able to create any type of program. The first thing is when you're programming, sometimes you have to test whether some certain condition is true or false. And then depending on that condition, you can execute either one thing or the other thing. And I think uh, from your uh, earlier answers, I, f I hear that many of you know already what this if else statement means, right? So it's basically either an if statement, if you just want to execute something if a particular condition is true, or you have an if else uh, clause where if this is true, you execute this over here. And if that is not true, then you execute this over here, right? That is, I think, from a readability point of view, very easy to see and even to, even to read, right? It's English, basically. If our number is smaller than zero, then we assign to our variable sign the character minus. Or here, the same, and if this is not the case, so if our number is bigger than or equal to zero, that is kind of explicitly or implicitly here given, then our sign is uh, becoming the value, the sign plus, right? That is, that is kind of how you use if or if else. And that allows us in our sequence of statements to pick and choose which statements we execute. And that is one of the fundamental things you do in programming. You test whether something is true or false, and then depending on, out of the, on the outcome of that test, you see whether you execute something, or you execute the other thing if, 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 uh, if you have an else statement. Right? So this is something, again, by practice, you will see how you can use this, and we're going to practice this also a lot of times. Um, but this is, as a concept, quite simple. So here are a couple of uh, repetitions again. We typically use relational operators, of course, because those are the ones that output a Boolean. And we need a Boolean after our if statement. And we always need those braces, by the way. Those braces are necessary. 
and then typically it would be good to also have braces for instance around the plus over here so they, we have the precedence um, or over here for instance if we have braces around the x plus one or braces around the one minus y so again we have the uh, operators here so if x is bigger or the value of x is bigger than the value of y then this is true and then we um, we can do something here right? we have a statement that is then being executed if this is not the case then we would not execute what is following after if. The same for is bigger than or equal, the same for if it's equal, what is on the left and on the right sides, or if it's not equal, or if it's smaller than or smaller than equal. Right? Those are kind of repetitions of the operators that we have already seen. This time they're following the if statement, and meaning that if this, uh, the compiler will then just say as soon as it meets the if keyword, it will then look at what is between braces afterwards. It will always have a Boolean then afterwards. Is this true or false? And only if this is true, it will then execute what is following those braces. Important is that what it usually, uh, what usually is following is, or what we've seen so far, is one statement. If we have multiple statements, what do we use then? A block. So we open the curly braces and then have multiple statements, and we close it with the curly braces. And that way, we can uh, then have multiple statements being executed if our if condition is met, right? So if there were multiple things we would have to do, if the number is smaller than zero, then we would write here the curly braces, and here we close the curly braces, and here we could have then our sequence of statements. Because we know now we can do that. That is a block, basically. And that is typically what we will do again and again and again. Now here again, a uh, repetition of our logical operators. So OR will return true if either read flag or write flag or both are true. It will only return false if uh, those two are false together, right? The AND operator will return true only when this over here and this over here are true. In all other cases, it will return false. The not operator will look what is coming afterwards, and if this is true, it will change this into false. If this is false, it will change this into true. Right, so that those are the three logical operators again. I think I didn't uh, specify the not operator, but it was in one of the examples. So again, there, try those out. These are the only ones that you have to know even though there are many, many more, those are the ones that will cover 99.9% .9 of all programming uh, problems, I would say. Okay, now the, pro the problem is with if else statements is that sometimes things can get a little bit tricky to read, especially when you nest things. So if you have an if else statement, sometimes you want to also test the second thing after this if statement, for instance, or another thing. In that case, you have to embed if-else statements, like over here, for instance. So if the number is zero, then we assign, in this case, sign is an integer variable, so we assign it the value zero. Otherwise, and then we go and test it again. So if the number is bigger than zero, then we assign uh, uh, the value uh, plus one to the sign, and otherwise, we assign minus one to our sign, right? This is something we could do. The question is, where does this else belong to? Does it belong to this if or this if? In this case, our indentation shows what it belongs to, but after doing this in, in a nested way, it can get really, really complicated. What I would do there is, I would uh, use the curly braces almost always if you have an if-else statement. If you remember our, um, uh, or my programming up until now, I think I've used the if statement already last week, if I'm not mistaken, when uh, looking at um, the, the birthday uh, paradox, I always automatically start creating an open curly braces block after an if statement. I would, um, I, I would think that this is the best way to program anyway. You never know whether there's only one statement following the if and if it's multiple, you have to start with curly braces. And in our uh, style, we always start with curly braces directly after the if, and then we change the next line. So it's much nicer to read 
if you do it exactly always. And this is basically uh, the reason why I advise you to always use the curly braces after the if and after the else. And you will see that CPPLint will ask you to do it on both sides as well. Because that is usually a good style of programming. Then you know what is belonging or what should be executed if this is true. Um, then you can see it through the indentation and through the block that you have afterwards. Right? And these are the reasons why this can be very confusing. Um, but, but that you can see and look at at home uh, for each of those four cases. I would say just use the curly braces always with an if-then statement. Now there's an other way, uh, another example where this sometimes can get very tricky. In this case, we do this. We have an if, then we follow our curly braces, our block, with multiple statements over here where those three dots are. And then we have an else if, and another else if, and another else if. Sometimes this could get a little bit tricky and a bit hard to read. In this case, there's a shortcut. If you have this if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, and all you do is check whether the value of one particular variable is a particular value. That's what we do here all the time. Then you can create a shortcut, and this shortcut is called the switch statement. And basically, just looking at this slide, you should be able to see what is happening. So this is exactly the same, meaning we switch on the value of our menu item variable. We look at the value of this variable. And if this is one, then we execute everything that is happening here. Here we can use a block with the curly braces. You don't have to. Um, and then once you add, uh, get to the breakpoint, so if you uh, meet this statement, then this is jumping all the way to the end of our switch block, right? This switch block over here is not a typical block as we've seen. It's not a collection or a sequence of statements. It belongs to our switch statement. And it's basically similar to an if-else statement, a kind of a switch where you can go multiple paths and the paths are given by the case statements over here. Right? So this is kind of a shortcut that makes it easier to implement something that is uh, uh, implemented here as well. So you could do it this way. This is perfectly valid. This way is a little bit more readable. You have to know, however, that the case is kind of defining when you have to start executing certain statements, the ones that come after here, and the fact that only when you have a break statement, you leave these switches or the switch again. So that if you want to test whether something is three or something is four, in this case, you can do it like this. You say case three, and then straight on the next line, you say case four, then execute what is written over here in these three dots. Right, that way you can accommodate for um, a particular variable having multiple va uh, values. So if it has a variable three or four, then these statements over here are executed. So th you could implement this with an if statement, but for readability in this case, the switch statement is much nicer. And then we come to the most powerful thing, that's why I'm going a little bit faster. And this is also what we're going the next three weeks to practice again and again and again, because even people that uh, have seen already C and C++ typically have a lot of problems with loops and also the if then uh, or if else uh, statements. So that's why these two, two things are extremely important. And we're going to see those uh, in the assignments that will be opened up uh, at noon again today, just like last week as well as the uh, on-site assignment that we'll have next week on Friday. So where you'll have to program something related to loops and the if-else statements on a piece of paper. So uh, the assignment that you're given this week will be due by next week Friday. But at the same time, next week Friday at assignments, you will have to come over here and fill on a piece of paper, just like at the exam at the end of the semester, uh, an example like this or an assignment like this. Right, so make sure you're there next week. So the loops is something that is essentially not very hard uh, to conceptualize, but requires a lot of ex uh, experience and a lot of uh, uh, trying out before you kind of see when you need to know which loop and how you use those loops. 
And there's only three variants. The first two are called the while and the do while loops. And for those two, you basically can a are able to repeat a block again and again and again. The while loop is uh, a very simple one. So basically you say you start with the while keywords and just like with the if keywords, you follow it always with braces. And then you see whether what is in these braces is true. If it's true, then you execute the block that is following it. Again, here you don't need a block. You could just follow with one statement. But typically that does not make sense. So always use curly braces after the while statement. That means we initialize here, in this case, two, in, uh, two integers, i and sum. We give them a value. And then we say, or we test, as soon as we get to the while statement, if i is smaller than 7, i is 1, so that is the case, we execute this block. And in this block, this i is incremented as well, right? We do some other things, like we say sum, the value of sum, or sum, our variable, is getting a new value. Namely, the value of sum plus the value of i. Remember that this assignment is a shortcut that is the same as saying sum equals sum plus i, right? Sum is zero, so in this case, after this line, sum has become one. Then we increment i. i was one, so i now gets the value two. So then after this block, i has become the value two, which is still smaller than seven, so we repeat this again. And this way we do this again and again and again. So because the while loop or the while statement is basically then evaluating this again, if this is true, we execute this again. And then we evaluate this again, and if this is true, we, we execute this again. So we could, in this way, repeat these statements over here infinitely. And this will happen to you as well. You forget, for instance, this i++ over here, and then your program will keep on running until eternity. Well, until our server crashes or uh, is shut down or um, is destroyed somehow. But basically, it will go on and on and on. In that case, and some of you have already seen this, I think, you could uh, press Control c in your terminal, and then it will quit your program the hard way, right? So that way you can, you can uh, remedy this. But this is a typical mistake that people make. They, try, they leave out, for instance, this condition, or this over here is written in such a way that this is never met. Now, this is something that could happen. But what you, the way you need to understand this while loop is, what comes after the while loop is tested, is a Boolean, and only if this is true, this block is, re is, is executed. And this is done repeatedly then, until what is here between those braces is false, and then it stops. So that is why after a while, when i really becomes seven, you know, it is first one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, six is still smaller than seven, but then after that, i plus plus means that i becomes, gets the value seven, Seven is not smaller than seven, that means this is false, and then this block is never executed, right? I think that is, go through it if you have never seen this before, but even if you have seen this before, I think this is uh, rather easy, I think, to also understand, especially if you experiment with this. The do while loop is exactly the same, but it's usually for those cases where you have to execute what is in this block at least once. So in this case, there is no test before this block is executed. The test only comes afterwards. And that is the only difference between the while and the do while. The do while basically always executes this block at least once. And then we check whether we need to execute this another time, and another time, and another time. So again, it's about repetition, but we at least execute this block one time at the beginning. Right, that's the only difference that we have for the do-while loop. Those two loops are typically all you need. You could actually solve all your looping uh, or repetition in a program with those two. There is, however, a third one, which many of you already know as well, I'm, I'm sure, which is called the for loop. And again, the for loop is a nice shortcut but the for, because the for loop kind of puts loads of things into one line. Just like the switch is a shortcut to the if else, if else, if else, uh, the for loop is a shortcut for the while loop or the do while loop. 
And the, the, the for loop kind of allows you to use uh, variables like i uh, in this case. And we can also, um, in this first line, integrate the i. That's how I think many of you that already know C or C++ typically do it. So in one line, you can basically initialize a variable, in this case i, we initialize it to zero. That's how we start with our loop. And then we say how often or when we need to repeat. So again, this is basically what comes after the while is exactly this over here. So while our i is smaller or equal than 10, we keep on executing our block that is following our for loop. And then a third part of this, what is between the braces, is what we do at every for loop at the end. And this is the i++. Right? So this is exactly the same as the example that we had on the previous slide for a while loop. But it's a lot shorter, and that's why people like the for loop. So we start, and that's the pr uh, th there is a, a little bit of a notation that you have to learn for this. So what is between the braces are three parts. The first part is like we create often and initialize a variable. Then we look at whether this, uh, there is uh, a need to stop our uh, block that is following. And then there is a thing that we always execute at the end of the block. And then uh, this is then re being repeated as such. Now the, the for um, loop is very powerful because this over here and this over here are statements. We can create anything over there. Typically people know this I++ because this is the default thing. But here we could have any type of statement. We could say that I equals I plus one as well. Or we could just say i equals i times 2. In that case, we multiply i by 2 each time. Or we could do very convoluted things in the loop. Typically, this doesn't make, not, not, not make much sense, but this is something that we could do. Now, when do you need which loop? As I said, you could always use the while or the do while loops. Those are always the ones that you could uh, use, and you never would need to have the for loop. But the for loop is typically a very nice shortcut if you know already beforehand how many times you have to repeat a particular block of statements. And I would say only then, when you can say, okay, I need to repeat this a thousand times, or I need to repeat this 20 times, only then use the for loop. And um, only in other cases, I think the while loop or the do while loop is uh, much nicer because there you can Re repeat things just like with a while loop, but think more about the cases when to stop. And that is kind of the, the intuition that you should develop in thinking about loops, because there is always a choice for a loop. Which one would here be the most appropriate? And typically you can switch between them. There is not really the, the right answer, but in sometimes uh, it is easier to uh, interpret your code if you use one loop versus the other. That's typically the case, and this is what is listed here on this slide, is the recipe you should follow for thinking about which loop is the making the most sense. All right, I'm going to quickly go over a couple of examples. I'm going to probably start doing them uh, tomorrow already. So you would have some examples uh, and you would see what is done, but I would already encourage all of you to start with these because these are quite a few examples. This one is an easy one that you should now know after seeing this slide. So if you write a program that prints out a number of series, we need to actually also include uh, IO stream here and then with STD C out, we should then start printing out numbers. Now the f question here is saying we start at 120.0, which is a double, right? Double floating point. And each number should be seven less than the previous one. So the next one should be 120 minus seven. And then that is 113, right? And the next one should be 113 minus seven, and so on. You could, before this, uh, this week's lecture, already do this. You could just output first 120. Then you could output 113. And by hand, with probably a, a couple dozen lines, you would have solved this problem as well, without a loop. Right? But with a loop, you can make this program so much more efficient. And that is the idea here. Which do, loop do we use here? A while loop, a do while loop, or a for loop? 
I'm not going to say the answer here. I would ask you try it out and try it out perhaps with uh, two or three of those possibilities. And then you will see that one of them is probably better. Now about uh, those loop or the definition of this loop, we need to stop once this number that we're getting, this next number, is smaller than 43.7. Now this already points to something that we need to check. Now you could do this with an if statement, right? You could just say if our number that we've now gotten is smaller than 43.7, then something happens. And that something that happens can then kind of flow into our looping stop condition. That is one way. But of course, when you talk about loops, there is always a stopping condition. That means you should already think about when to stop the loop and what the condition of that stopping the loop is. So perhaps you don't need an if class here. Right? That is the, the other part that this example kind of starts teaching you. And like that, there is also this where we need to do exactly the same. We need to go over certain numbers. In this case, we're not going to simply increment or decrement a variable, like in the previous one, where you do always minus seven, minus seven, minus seven, minus seven. Here we have our variable. So we have a variable that starts out at 100, and then we divide it by two, and then we divide it by two again, and then behind, uh, divide it by two again, and so on. And it needs to stop at a certain point as well. This is a little bit more difficult, I think, because of this, a, a, a non-typical operator that you need to use for getting to the next block and repeating this, or the next iteration of the block. Uh, the same for this one, so here it's just counting down. But here in this case, you need to print the number if it's not a multiple of seven, and you need to print instead of that hop if it is a multiple of seven. So here, the first question is, what loop do I use? But the next thing is, I need to print out that number, but sometimes I don't need to print out the number, but instead of that, print something completely different. What do I do there? Right, that's another thing. And then we get a little bit more difficult. In this case, uh, I'm asking for, and this is something that I think is definitely uh, too difficult for those who have never seen programming at all, but it would still be important to know this in a few weeks. So do actually try and to tackle this. So write a program that prints in the terminal all prime numbers from three till 99. Again, you could do this as constants. You, do, you calculate by yourself as a programmer and just do uh, see out that number, see out that number, see out that number. But again, a loop will be able to make this more efficient. Now, how do you create uh, with a loop in this case, it's a nested loop that you will need. All prime numbers from 3 to 99. A little bit harder. Then we get to something that I typically ask at the end of the year always. A particular loop within a loop. That's the only way you could uh, solve this type of question. So sometimes you need a loop, for instance, a loop that goes to all the lines. And another loop to say what is done for each character within a line. So writing a program that draws this big X, depending on the variable of uh, uh, size in this case, so if size is three, you have to create this. If size is four, you have to create this in the terminal. If size is five, you have to create this. This is an excellent example of nested loop, and this is what I hope you're all able to do at the end of the semester, because it will be a, a question at the exam. <coughs> Again, a little bit more difficult and definitely not the thing that I would think you would be able already capable to do it this week or the next week. Right? So don't worry too much about it. If this is too hard, but do try it and do look at what your fellow colleagues um, answer uh, for this particular question. And then if you want it more difficult, you know, changing from this to this makes it a little bit more difficult as well. And like this, there's thousands of questions I could ask. Not an X, but a Z, or a Y, or an H, or just a slash, or a backslash. You know, there's the, the possibilities are endless. Or an S, right? So there's loads of things I could do um, in terms of asking something. The essential things here are always the same. And then thinking about this in an algorithmic way is something that I hope you're able to do at the end of the semester. Because that is really what program is about, to do this in an efficient uh, way and all of this can be done with the things you've seen this week already. 
So with if and else statements and with uh, the loops that we've seen. All right, with that, we're done with uh, today's lecture. As I said, and I'll repeat again, tomorrow or in a few hours, you will get a new assignment already on Moodle. And then you will get a little bit more than a week, so until next Friday, to complete this assignment, just like you completed the assignment of last week. Although there you had a few days, now you'll have a whole week. This is important that you do this, because now the points will start counting. For this first assignment, that was bonus. Now the assignment will start counting for points for your assignments. And then even more important, next week, what you will see is you will just have to come here, and then after a few minutes, everyone will be given a piece of paper, like at the exam, and you will have to write by pen and paper the, uh, uh, an exam question, a very typical exam question where the if-else statement is being asked for, the loops are being asked for, and then what variables are. So it's not very, very hard, and the assignment that you will get today is a perfect preparation for what you will do to, uh, next week in that case, right? Okay, with that, thank you for coming, and we'll see each other tomorrow.